Good evening and welcome everyone to St. Peter's University. We are very honored to have Mayor Stephen Fullop with us tonight to address a topic that affects every one of us, the state of Jersey City. Mayor Fullop is a New Jersey native who grew up in nearby Edison. And before becoming the 49th mayor of Jersey City, one of the youngest mayors in the country, I might add, Mayor Fullop served as the councilman for Ward E in Jersey City for eight years. He currently, among his many activities, is a member of the Board of Trustees at Liberty Science Center and previously served on the Board of Directors for the Columbia University Alumni Association, as well as on the board for the Learning Community Charter School. This evening, we, I know, are all eager to hear about the mayor's plans for our city, our beloved city, including developing both Journal Square and McGinley Square, advancing the arts in Jersey City, enhancing public safety throughout our city, improving education, and that means a great deal to us here at St. Peter's, of course, and expanding pre-K opportunities, and creating jobs, jobs for Jersey City residents, among many other initiatives. We are also enthusiastic about learning his plans for the launch of a branding campaign to attract more commercial and residential development as well as tourism to Jersey City. These changes will have a considerable impact on the St. Peter's University community and on Jersey City as a whole. We look forward to working with Mayor Fulop and all the members of our community to help transform our home here at McGinley Square and throughout all of this wonderful city. Thank you for being here, and we look forward to a wonderful evening of marvelous information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Let me start by saying good evening to uh, everyone here, President Kornakia, Dr. Poyani, Council President Rolando Lavaro, Council Members, Reverend Clergy, and most importantly, my fellow Jersey City residents. Thank you for joining me tonight as I reflect upon the state of our city. We were elected last year on a clear mandate for progressive change. There was a pressing need to forge a common future for our entire community. See, progressive change doesn't mean alienating one community or being divisive with rhetoric for the sake of motivating a political base. Rather, progressive change means setting clear goals for the future that provides opportunities for everyone. Now, for decades, Jersey City had been able to leverage its proximity to New York City. Old industrial sites we know gave way to gleaming residential towers and battered docks and abandoned rail yards became parks and streetscapes. Yet while there was investment downtown, to many other parts of the city were slowly deteriorating. All in all, there was a sense of multiple cities within Jersey City. So my goal and our administration's goal was and is to forge one city. We won't alienate business, we won't alienate success, but rather embrace it and encourage it as we move Jersey City forward. We have made solid progress and we're picking up speed, but I'll be the first to say there is more to do before we can really declare Jersey City as the best mid-sized city in America. Tonight, I stand before you to report on the state of our city and my many priorities for 2014. In each area, whether it's public safety, or whether it's education, or whether it's taxes, or whether it's development, I'm gonna provide for you tonight, not platitudes, but rather with clear, quantifiable goals to be measured. I know, and we know, expectations are high, as I would tell you they should be. But I also know we will succeed, and I'm gonna tell you that because I believe in our team, and I believe, more importantly, in Jersey City. So let me start by saying, before we can change our city's landscape and build economic opportunities, there must be a sense of safety here in Jersey City. This past summer, as we took office, Many of you know that there were seven murders in five weeks, which really resulted in heightened fears and concerns throughout the city. And as an administration and as a city, we were determined to really stop that violence. We immediately reassigned officers, so more police were on patrol. We implemented a series of sweeps, resulting in more than 200 arrests. Thanks.
specifically to address the shootings, we created a ceasefire unit to investigate and give priority to the non-fatal shootings. And I'm going to point out that this unit has a successful solve rate of 53%, and that's more than double the New Jersey average. In large measure, we have succeeded in turning the page on crime, but as I said, I'll be the first to say there is much more to do. Let me be clear, Jersey City today is the safest big city in the state of New Jersey, though at the same time, we certainly have more work to do. And through the leadership of our public safety director, Jim Shea, who's here, our police chief, Cowan, the community and religious leaders that are here tonight, and of course, the courage of the uniformed men and women, we will continue to build upon the progress we have made so far. Another tool we have deployed is a data-driven crime analysis system for the first time. We're actually going out examining 911 data to isolate hotspots and identify spikes in crime wherever they are in the city. And for the first time in the history of the city, we are looking at where crime happens down to the time of the day, down to the minute, and specific addresses. And then we're taking our troops and we're reallocating them, our personnel, to those places at those times. Another important initiative I want to highlight from 2013 was working with the council president and the city council. We were able to consolidate our fire and police department into one public safety department. I tell you, this allowed us to cut costs in addition to putting more police and more firefighters on the street. When we took office in July, we had 760 sworn officers. Including our recruits today that are scheduled to graduate, we have 845 uniformed officers. Since July, we've already graduated one class of 34 recruits and another class of 40 officers. And I want to highlight that the last class that's in the academy right now is the most diverse class in the history of Jersey City. Now, let's talk about our goals for 2014. And our goals for 2014 are clear. We, as an administration, will reduce crime in the majority of the categories of the FBI uniform crime statistics nationally recognized. We will reduce crime by double-digit percentages, period. This is our target. It is clear. It is ambitious. And we expect to be held to it throughout 2014. <laughs> to flourish, though, a city must be safe. To prosper, its people must feel secure, and there's no greater responsibility than the safety of our community. I want to say to all of our uniformed personnel, police, fire, and emergency responders, I thank you for what you do today and every single day, placing the interests of our residents ahead of your own public safety. And we have an aggressive goal for this year, and we will achieve it together. Now, moving from public safety to economic development, in the next five years, Jersey City will undergo the largest economic expansion in recent history. In fact, Jersey City will be the largest city in New Jersey by the end of 2016. And this is an <laughs> And this is not happening by accident. Our policies are helping to attract commercial, attract retail, and attract industrial development and creating thousands of new jobs. See, Jersey City is climbing out of the recession at a faster rate than the state of New Jersey and at a faster rate than the United States as a whole. And I'd like to highlight that the unemployment rate in Jersey City dropped three percentage points from June to no November, whereas the national unemployment rate only dropped half a percentage point. I tell you that because unemployment in Jersey City is dropping at nearly six times faster than the nation at large. That's why we were confident in paving the way and creating the first earned sick leave policy in the state of New Jersey. <laughs> policy is allowing parents to care for themselves or a loved one without losing the job. It's important legislation, it's principled legislation, and I tell you, all residents of Jersey City should be proud that we as a city are leading the way. Now, Jersey City is experiencing an unprecedented boom in development. I want to highlight that. There are over 5,600 residential units under construction right now, and that's the highest level of construction in recent history. Along, there's 200,000 square feet of retail space under construction right now. I also want to highlight there's 800,000 square feet of industrial space under construction right now in Jersey City. We've also approved already 11,000 housing units moving forward. Now, this surge in development will stimulate our economy and move us forward towards becoming what we strive to be, which is the best city in the country as it relates to anything our size. Now, I also want to highlight that in five years, the 20 biggest buildings in the entire state of New Jersey 
Each and every one will be here in Jersey City. I also want to highlight that during the last big surge in development in the early 2000s, the dollars spent on new construction in Jersey City exceeded the total spent in the rest of the state of New Jersey combined. And I tell you, <laughs> we, we right now are in the cusp of what looks like an even bigger boom than ever been before. So for this year, our goal as an administration is very clear. Jersey City will lead the state in job creation, Jersey City will lead the state in new building permits, and Jersey City will lead the state in square footage of new development created in the year 2014. That is clear. I want to say while the national and state housing markets are just beginning to recover, Jersey City is really flourishing at an unprecedented levels. Development though is not only happening downtown, from McKinley Square, to Bergen Lafayette, to the west side, we are actually seeing progress and we are seeing development. For the first time in decades, in decades, steel is actually coming out of the ground in Journal Square. And specific to Journal Square, 10 projects are underway right now and another 23 have already been proposed or approved. Now, we're not only talking about construction jobs, I want to highlight that. It's many new permanent jobs are coming to Jersey City as well. Forbes, as an example, is bringing 250 jobs to Jersey City after nearly 100 years being across the river. Nautica is bringing 200 jobs to Jersey City. Devita Dialysis is bringing 70 jobs to the hub and other neighborhoods in Jersey City. And I tell you that the more is on the way. And with the change in administration across the river, there is a unique window and we intend to capitalize it as a city. Now, while attracting large and commercial and retail employers is important, as our Chamber of Commerce knows, small businesses are the backbone to Jersey City's economy. I take pride in Jersey City's small business owners, such as the group of small businesses that transform Westside Avenue into a commercial district purely by virtue of hard work and sweat equity. They did it with no help from government. In 2014, we are now working with the Westside Avenue small business owners, championed by Councilman Ramchow and community stakeholders and we are going to build, develop on the west side a special improvement district so businesses can further flourish. I mean, the lesson for government is clear. It's to create a working partnership with our business community and to be a force to help them and then get out of the way. Development and population growth on this scale will place greater demand on our public transit system. I think we all recognize that. And though we already have the most extensive network in the state, I think we all know that it must grow. We as an administration have been working with New Jersey Transit to expand light rail capacity by 40% system-wide this year. We've put 20 more taxis on the street this year, and we will install bus shelters this year. All of this is funded without cost to the taxpayers. And in the case of the taxis, it has resulted in millions of dollars of additional city revenue coming into the city coffers. But I tell you, not all development is good, and especially it's not all good if our residents don't benefit from it. So that Jersey City residents benefit from this economic expansion, our administration is committed to enforcing labor agreements and actually holding developers accountable for their worker quotas of Jersey City residents and minorities that they committed to. Unemployment. Thank you. Unemployment is unacceptably high in communities of color, particularly among young men. And Jersey City will change this abysmal reality here in Jersey City. Developers will meet their obligations to hire Jersey City residents and people of color. And when they sign an agreement with the city to undertake both commitments, I can assure you, as sure as I am standing here, they will be enforced. Already, we have met with several developers who have committed to being more aggressive in hiring local residents. And I commend the laborers in specific and those developers for their willingness to provide a special Jersey City apprenticeship class. And I tell you that partnering with Pat Kelleher, who's here tonight, and the Hudson County Building Trades, we are working with juniors and seniors in Jersey City high schools to offer a career in the construction trades. <laughs> Education and job training is important. And by improving our process for job training and forging new partnerships and practicing tougher enforcement and labor agreements, we expect to increase the percentage of successful job claimants 
via the Jersey City Employment and Training by a full one-third this year. That is our commitment and we will achieve it. It is a clear goal and one which we will conquer. But <laughs> bluntly and honestly, when it comes to education, our children, we must do more. Jersey City and its schools need to be laboratories of innovation that break from the outdated models of 50 years ago. We are in a more competitive global economy and we must think differently. The leadership of our school system must also be progressive and think differently. It cannot afford to plod cautiously into the future while our children fall further and further behind. We need to create competitive educational programs that will better prepare our students for higher education and encourage them to acquire those technical skills so critical for success in today's technology-driven jet labor market. Job growth trends reveal that the skills required of the future workforce are changing and they are changing fast. And despite the need for greater knowledge and understanding of technical equipment and processes, students are not getting a solid technical education. We are committed here in Jersey City to change that. Months ago, I had the opportunity to tour Eastern Millworks. It's an advanced manufacturing firm located in Cavan Point here in Jersey City that provides design woodwork to some of the most exclusive venues in the entire world. I recognize then the challenge for Eastern Millwork and its president, Andrew Campbell, who's here tonight, is not a lack of work for their business, but a lack of skilled worker to do the work. And to address this challenge, we, as an administration, are assembling a high-tech and educational task force. It's going to be co-chaired by Mr. Campbell, as well as Vice President Gail Spack of NJIT. And the goal is to design a pilot program for Jersey City students to enter the workforce with technical competencies. With Eastern Millwork, ps and UPS, Goya, Tropicana, all already signed on, we will establish a mentor program which will afford students familiarity with applied mechatronics and advanced manufacturing processes during their senior year in high school, followed then by intensive academic and technical education at NJIT. NJIT, on their side, will offer credit courses, both in person and online, in engineering, robotics, and mechatronics. This program has the potential to be a model for the state of New Jersey, and we are proud of it. Now, as our city grows, so too does our school population. Jersey City is the only urban school district in New Jersey that is growing. According to a recent demographic study by the district, Jersey City public schools will grow by more than 4,000 students in the next five years. And to nobody's surprise, the fastest growing segment of our school population is in pre-K. Many couples in Jersey City hope to raise a family here. They love the city. And quality education options are critical to their decisions regarding whether to remain part of the community or to leave. To close the gap between growing pre-K demand and supply, our administration is leveraging development tools to support the building of new pre-K facilities across the entire city. There are two new pre-K facilities presently under planning and one existing facility, a former charter school, that is being proposed for the Board of Education. The city has offered to partially finance the new facility in Ward B. This would be the first in the city's history. And we've also incentivized a developer to build an early childhood center in Ward E and lease it to the Board of Education at a 40% discount below market rent. We've also offered to deeply discount the rent at the former charter school in Ward E because we believe in the importance of pre-K everywhere. We are able to move forward. The new facilities will house the Board of Education's nationally recognized pre-K programs. And more importantly, it will house more than 300 students. However, as the Board of Education well knows, we will not support new pre-K facilities in downtown only. While having children in other parts of the city housed in school trailers, storefronts, or overcrowded schools. So today, stand here today, I call upon our residents to challenge the school district to support the creation of these school facilities for the benefit of our children, not only in one area of the city, but in every area of the city, because it's crucial to our future. Now let me say, despite initial progress, we still have a concern as to how the school district spends some of its money. With many dedicated teachers, support staff, and administrative professionals, Jersey City Public Schools should be a model for the entire state of New Jersey. In fact, that is our goal as administration. Unfortunately, many of our schools are still falling short of that mark. During the 2012 and 2013 school year, the statewide spending per pupil averaged $18,000. In contrast, 
Jersey City schools spent a little bit more than 22,000. That's nearly 24% more than the state average. Now with an annual budget for the schools of over $660 million, the school district must do a better job of budgeting, of driving excellence, and driving financial transparency. The children and parents of this city do not exist to serve the needs of any leadership, whether in the administration or in the schools. The schools exist to serve the needs of our children. I think we all agree on that. As an example, the Jersey City School District spent only $116 per pupil on extracurricular activities during the 2011-2012 school year. It's 38% less than the state average. I point this out to you because this is particularly alarming considering the challenges facing children in areas like Jersey City. We know our children are safe from 8 a.m until 3 p.m., September till June, but without programs outside of school hours, our children can easily become inactive or worse, involved with street life. To address this specific issue, Jersey City is providing opportunities and programming after school and during the summer programming, which will provide educational and character building experiences. This summer, young people in Jersey City will have an opportunity to give back to their community and earn spending money through the summer employment program known as Stop the Drop. Launched last summer, we received positive feedback on the program and will expand it this year to hire even more youth to not only clean up our city, but also as camp counselors, to work in City Hall, as aides, and working at the pools throughout the city. Now I say that fun in the summer is important, but it's also a good time for young people to challenge themselves and learn through authentic work experiences. City Hall, for the first time, is partnering with some of the largest and most prestigious companies in Jersey City on the waterfront to launch a summer internship program for high achieving students from high schools across the city. We have had strong positive response from firms like Direct Edge, like Goldman Sachs and Fidelity. And this summer, students from Dickinson High School will have the opportunity to be at Pershing and students from Snyder will have the opportunity to be at the Hyatt and they will receive academic credit and importantly, also a financial stipend. Let's point out that we will begin accepting student applications in March and this program will open doors to meaningful opportunities for Jersey City youth and at the same time will bring together youth and the business sector. True to traditionally disparate Jersey City communities coming together to move forward. So now just as economic development and job creation provide an economic base and an education as I said is the foundation for our future culture and arts help to create a community. Complete, balanced communities create jobs, but they also appreciate and exclaim the values of the arts in our lives. One thing lacking in Jersey City in recent years was a modernized, world-class performance arts venue. That's about to change. The Lowe's Jersey, one of five wonder theaters built in the 20s, tells the story of Jersey City itself. We owe a special thanks to the Friends of the Lowe's, a passionate group of volunteers who mounted a promotional campaign to save the theater from imminent demolish, demolition. Since that time, the Friends of the Lowe's has worked diligently to restore it, dedicating thousands of volunteer hours to help restore functionality to that facility. In order to take the next step with this facility, we recently issued a public, fair, and open solicitation for proposals of management and restoration of the Lowe's Jersey Theater. We expect to not only fully restore the facility, but more importantly, will provide patrons with a higher volume and a wider variety of programming, ranging from national to international touring musical acts to the continuation, of course, of the popular si silent film screenings and, of course, other community events. The last five mayors have each tried to achieve this, and in 2014, this will 100% be a reality. Now, Jersey City's cultural vibrancy is really unparalleled in the state of New Jersey. Unfortunately, though, in the past few years, this has been more despite the city's efforts than because of them. I want our arts community to view the city as a partner and a dynamic launching pad for the future. Since we took office, we have actively engaged the cultural resources of Jersey City. We have made it a priority to always act as a facilitator for artistic and creative activity in all parts of the city, clearing red tape wherever possible and all sorts of obstacles. 
Through the Jersey City Murals Arts Program, we have commissioned nine massive murals on visible walls around the city since July, with another 12 teed up for this spring. We, we have taken pains to ensure these murals are inspired by the neighborhoods they beautify, that they tell the story of Jersey City, of the places and community that they reside in. Now, we always give local artists priority, but at the same time, our program has garnered national and international interest, featuring artists from Hawaii, Italy, Japan, New York, and South Africa. All of this is financed by a Clean Communities Grant, costing you, the taxpayer, nothing. I want to say that the horizon for Jersey City's arts community is very bright, and we are working to develop a signature event with a new arts commission. Jersey City's advancement as an artistic center has not gone unnoticed. I want to highlight the Mana Contemporary on the west side of town. It's grown into a world-class art institution, a cultural center that provides services, provides space, and programming for artists, collectors, curators, performers, students, and of course the community. Later this year, the city will embark on a $1.2 million marketing campaign for Jersey City to tell the story of Jersey City and to continue to attract that creative class here to Jersey City. Now, for every single dollar that the administration invests in that branding campaign, the private sector will match us, further expanding our reach dollar for dollar. Our goal in 2014 is to tell the story of Jersey City and make sure that people in the tri-state area know who we are. Yet all of this, the building, the educating, the arts, it doesn't really add up to a city. A city is made up by its people and their values. Whether it's our Beat the Street basketball program, or raising money for the Filipino typhoon, or our efforts to beautify our homes, it is really serving one another in our daily lives by which we create a true community. And if we have taught our children, grown our economy, protected our seniors, what more is asked of a community? So I ask us, as a community, who is there to be served that makes us uncomfortable? For whom do we as a community have little sympathy? Who, in the midst of our busy and hectic lives, is it easy or even sometimes preferable to forget or ignore? So I'll answer it. I say that nearly 70% of all incarcerated persons in the Hudson County Jail and in New Jersey State Prisons are clinically classified as addicts or alcoholics. The addict inmate, upon release, has to struggle to find a place to live, struggle to find food to eat, and against all odds, a paying job to enable survival. I think we all agree that the probability of their securing housing, work, and treatment is virtually zero. In the Marine Corps, we were told never leave a man behind. And we here in Jersey City also believe no person should be discarded, that no life is unredeemable, and so as a progressive and as a Marine, we are doing things differently here in Jersey City. Our reentry program is founded on the principle that we all deserve a second chance. Successful reentry has three tenets. One, recovery is essential. Two, work and the dignity of work empower the ex-offender financially and emotionally. And then third, ex-offenders need stable housing in order to move forward. And frankly, this has been the most difficult aspect of our reentry efforts. And while we've been working to find jobs for everyone in Jersey City, ex-offender or not ex-offender, on Monday, this coming Monday, we will formally launch our reentry program, which will adhere to these tenants and provide treatment, housing options, and job opportunities for ex offenders. It is <laughs> our goal is to enable them to become healthy and productive members of society. And furthermore, our goal is to reduce recidivism for those ex-offenders by a full third from the Hudson County average in 2014. It is a marked goal, it is a clear goal, and again, it is something that we can achieve. And so, in this is my report to you, my sense that the state of the city is progressing and gaining momentum, and I tell you, we aim higher, we work harder, and we demand more of ourselves as a government and as a people. See, my friends, as an administration and government, we have tackled the legacy of corruption and incompetence and the ills of inefficiency, and progress has been made on many fronts, but for sure we need to do more. And thanks to these efforts, we are now operating a more efficient government than ever before. 
There are those who say that government is wasteful and should be curtailed, that it doesn't know how to manage money, and I contest that this government is a living counterexample to that notion. With a willingness to make tough budgetary choices by this city council, we have realized cost savings in many parts of our municipal government. And more importantly, we have added $118 million of rateables to the tax roll this year, more than any city in the state of New Jersey. And I am proud to announce that in 2014, we will introduce a budget with a tax reduction and providing flexibility to the city council. Tonight, I'd also like to take the opportunity to say thank you to all of you. We must always search for innovation, always seek to serve, and always strive for far-sighted stewardship. If we adhere to this, we will know the fulfillment of our aspirations and, of course, the realizations of our dreams and a prosperous and healthy future for our children. That's what will make Jersey City, and that alone will make Jersey City the best mid-sized city in America. See, in this special place, Jersey City, to which tired people traveled past the Statue of Liberty, Lady Liberty, to let us ensure that their dream, the American dream, burns as fiercely today as it has throughout our history. And I tell you that if we do that, our children and our children's children will know we did all that was required of us to make good on the optimism, courage, and hope for a better future and pushing through that golden door to a place we call home, a place called Jersey City, a place we all love. Thank you, good night, and God bless Jersey City.